Ladies and gentlemen, we're really fortunate this afternoon to have Congresswoman Jane Harmon, who served in the Congress as a member of the House of Representatives for nine terms, joining us. Among her many accomplishments while in Congress, she served six years on armed services, eight years on intelligence, and eight years on homeland security. During her long and very distinguished public career, Congresswoman Harmon has been recognized as a national expert at the nexus of security and public policy issues. Congresswoman Harmon is a trustee of the Aspen Institute, an honorary trustee of the University of Southern California, and is a member of the Presidential Debates Commission. She is a magna cum laude graduate of Smith College and Harvard Law School. For the last decade, she has very ably led the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C., and, and as its first female director and president and CEO, she has performed magnificently in leading the process of policy development at the Woodrow Wilson International Center. We're so grateful that she could take her time today uh, to join us to speak about global collaboration and America's leadership as we move forward into the 21st century. So Congresswoman Harmon, Jane, thank you so much for being with us here today. Delighted Jane, to be here. Jane, what I would like to do, uh, because our time is limited, and if you have comments, you can make them at the beginning, is to pose the first question, if I may. The times of George Washington were naturally very difficult. And as you have known, uh, we he greatly feared that America was becoming too entangled in foreign alliances. At the same time, anything resembling true isolation is all but impossible for us today. And with that in mind, how do we find the, the right balance between collaborating globally and taking care of America's sovereign and domestic interests? Well, if I may, let me say first that I'm delighted to participate with you uh, in this very interesting conference, uh, saluting the leadership, I think, of uh, George Washington, our first president who understood how to lead uh, the presidency and how to leave the presidency. Uh, very important lesson. And I also want to salute your leadership. Uh, we overlapped, my political terms in Congress overlapped your leadership in the military, uh, at, at, Co at, uh, at CENTCOM and also as commander of ISAF. And we've been dear friends uh, in the think tank world. And uh, John Allen, I won't let you cut this out of the interview. Uh, you and Kathy are very cherished friends of, of mine. So uh, I'm happy to be here. Um, on this issue of how do we balance international commitments and uh, domestic commitments, uh, I have to say I hate the word balance. I don't think this is a balance. I don't think it's a zero-sum game. I have been saying for two decades that uh, security and liberty uh, need to be protected at the same time. That's what Ben Franklin said, uh, and he's even older than I am. Uh, so I think that uh, the Biden, the incoming Biden administration has the right frame. In order to be strong globally, we have to be strong at home. And I think the challenge now is to make us stronger in both places. Well, this is a moment where American strength and American leadership is going to be imperative uh, to the 21st century and to our friends overseas mm -hmm. and to those who would wish us ill. And so it's very important, as you have well put it. So clearly, we face a number of issues that have global uh, implications. The environment, a global pandemic, immigration, a plethora of international security issues, just, just to name a few. I mean, this is a, a long, long list, yeah. but a few of them here. What, in your view, is the right role for the U.S. to play as we move forward in the 21st century in the context of leadership on the international stage? Well, let me say first that um, the last president I can think of who really articulated a strategy for US, the U.S. role in the world, whether we agree with it or not, was Ronald Reagan. Uh, and since then, we have had uh, interesting presidents in both parties who have, by my lights, been more tactical than strategic about foreign policy. And I'm sure you're going to ask me more about this, but my basic uh, comment here is that uh, the Biden administration needs to articulate a strategy for U.S. leadership. And here's my uh, suggestion. Uh, a, a dear friend of mine, whom I've known since we were staffers in in the Senate, imagine that, is Madeleine Albright. And she, for years, called America uh, the, the indispensable nation. 
Uh, every time she said that, I said, wait a minute, Madeline, America is the indispensable partner. And my idea about what to do is to restore our alliances, build some new friendships, and with them articulate a strategy for a free and peaceful world. Well, you, you've touched a, an important issue about whether the United States <clears throat> is a partner, uh, has been a partner, and will be a reliable partner in the future. But let me ask about on balance, uh, mm -hmm. as you look at the international response, for example, to the pandemic, what are some of the key lessons learned from the international collaboration that we might have undertaken yeah. or that we ought to undertake as we move forward? And given the uniquely multifaceted nature of America and its in its many regions and cultures, what have we learned uh, about ourselves that we can apply to the lessons that we could uh, extend to our friends overseas and our allies? Well, the, the saddest thing, John, is we have to learn from others at this point how to manage the pandemic. Our teachers are New Zealand, Taiwan, uh, South Korea. Uh, how did that happen? Uh, we're the country, oh, by the way, I think in the George W. Bush administration, or maybe early Obama, who staged a logistics effort into Africa to deal with the Ebola epidemic and prevent it from, a com from coming to America. We ought to do these things. In this case, it's not all our fault. Uh, I think there is very credible evidence that the Chinese uh, misled, uh, covered up the nature and lethality of this uh, sure. of this. Uh, epidemic. I think that's on them. But then we imagined that everything would be fun and easy and no problem and we'd only have 10 cases. And we failed to use the tools we have. Uh, we have had at least four or five uh, pandemics or at least epidemics, something like this in the United States. And there is a toolkit uh, to use. We didn't deploy it. Uh, the Defense Production Act is probably the best tool, which was never fully deployed, which could organize and order the United States and all of our public and private sector uh, facilities uh, to manage this, this, this problem. And we didn't do testing, we didn't do tracing, and now we're not doing effective distribution of, of two different vaccines, both of which are 90% effective. So what do we do now? Um, as indispensable partner in the world, we restore our membership in the World Health Organization and we launch with capable people at the helm in the Biden administration, a worldwide effort to uh, finally get this under control. And why worldwide? We have urgent needs in our country, which is just about at the bottom of the bottom in terms of dealing with this. Uh, I say we won't get our, our own country under control if we don't help the world get under control. But I also say, that the best thing we could do in terms of reestablishing America's moral and, and actual leadership in the world is to help the world recover from this. Marvelous. And you touched on a, on a matter which is really going to be central to the role of America going forward, the, the leadership role, mm -hmm. uh, not just with our, our uh, friends and allies, but the leadership role as it has to be perceived by those who may be our opponents or our competitors. Right. Let's talk about China for a moment, because you touched on that a moment ago. And so for many years, the, this idea of the West was an organizational construct that helped us to compete against and to, and to help stand off against the Soviet Union, which is really a nuclear existential threat to everything that we stood for. Now, do we face a sort of Cold War with China today? And, and if not, is conflict inevitable, as Graham Allison uh, in the concept of the Thucydides trap has has suggested? Or can we instead find our way forward through American leadership again to a more cooperative relationship with the Chinese, defined by honest competition, but by out-competing, as opposed to in being in perennial confrontation or the attempt to contain the Chinese? What, what Jane, as you think about leadership in the 21st century on behalf of the United States and America, what should that look like as it relates to the China relationship? Well, you started with the Cold War, which we won. Let's understand that. Yes, we did. Ronald Reagan was president, and he handed off the presidency peacefully to George H.W. Bush, who basically concluded it. We won the Cold War. We then made a bunch of mistakes, and that has to do with China. Uh, we won the Cold War, and we thought we were the unipolar power in the world forever and ever. 
and we missed China's rise. Uh, we missed it. And we thought that if China rose, China would want to be us. Well, guess what? China doesn't want to be us. And China is a very able competitor to us. And China may actually, in terms of all the stats, uh, exceed us uh, in some near term. And this may end up being the Asian secretary. It's, it's the Asian century. Mm -hmm. um, so let's get over ourselves. Now what? Uh, what you've suggested is right. Uh, China is both a, a competitor and, uh, and a country that we can cooperate with. We've got to sort this out. Uh, China has done some things that are really wrong, and we should call China on these things. And I salute the uh, Trump administration for identifying uh, intellectual property theft, uh, not being tough enough on the abuse of human rights in, in Hong Kong and against the Uyghurs, but they got it right that China's doing bad stuff. They got it wrong in terms of a strategy for curbing bad stuff and promoting good stuff. And so the opportunities are pretty broad, I think. One of them is climate. You've mentioned climate. Uh, you can't solve climate by building national borders. Uh, climate is an international problem. China and we are the big polluters. So we need to work with China, which we had started to do in the Obama administration, and which we will continue to do, I predict, uh, when John Kerry, uh, former Secretary of State and former Senator, becomes our climate czar. Good thing. We'll get back into the Paris Agreement. Um, and there's one way to cooperate with China. We have to cooperate with China, uh, regardless of their bad behavior on the pandemic. We have to cooperate with China on the pandemic. Um, and then comes harder stuff in the commercial area. Uh, but I think that the, from what I can tell, the Biden team is very talented and can thread a needle here and, and find a strategy that will be much more effective. China's economy is hurting. Uh, there's a huge move of Chinese to the cities. The cities are not, don't have the capacity to deal with this. Uh, uh, Xi Jinping is very powerful, uh, but if he can't deliver for his people, he's going to have a lot of trouble. So he's got a domestic problem, and uh, as we do. Uh, there, it seems to me, are wise people out there, one of whom is only 97. Uh, his name is on the... Uh, the, the, the Institute at the Wilson Center, that's called the Kissinger Institute for China mm -hmm. and the U.S. Right. Uh, he started this in terms of cooperation in the early 70s, and he still has great ideas. And he thinks that we need to be tougher and we need to be smarter. And, uh, you know, to quote Martin Luther King in an age of uh, systemic racism, the arc of history bends toward justice. Let's hope the arc of U.S.-China relationship bends toward uh, cooperation and only uh, confrontation where we must. Well, that's a terrific answer. And, and as you know, as we've been watching the relationship unfold over the last several years, sometimes it has seemed to be strategy-less. Yeah. So if the basis of our strategy is be tougher, but also look for opportunity, I think that's a good way to, to move forward. Now, the United States faces many challenges right now at, at the domestic level. Uh, they're quite complex. They've been quite persistent. And I think that the coming administration and American leadership in the 21st century domestically has a lot of challenges ahead of it. Mm -hmm. uh, but we also have a lot of challenges globally as well. Jane, as you look out across the world stage, uh, and as we begin to move deeper into the century, uh, what are going to be some of the greatest challenges, maybe even the single greatest challenge that the United States will face that will demand American leadership as we move forward in this century? Well, uh, again, I think uh, Joe Biden, who is a very old friend of mine, who came to the Senate when I was a Senate aide uh, in, in 1973, imagine that, uh, and had just suffered the loss of his wife and his daughter. I mean, it was a tragic, scary time for him, but he pulled himself together. But Biden has articulated uh, four priorities that I think are the answer to your question. Um, one is solving the pan pandemic. Two is fixing the economy. And it's not just our economy. Our economy is a global economy. So fixing or helping to fix the economy. Three is climate. And talk about an existential challenge. Uh, I, I come from California, uh, a state that is melting down. I, I live in a tsunami zone in Venice Beach, literally. That's what the signs all say. Uh, and 
uh, the, the fires and the floods and the riots, and it's just, you know, the golden state is a little tarnished. So climate is three and four, which we have to put on the agenda, and which I salute you in the Brookings, uh, and Brookings for focusing on, is systemic racism. It's not just a problem in this country. I mean, the history of slavery is incredibly ugly, uh, but it is a problem worldwide. And again, we, we have to wrestle our demons. We have to know who we are. We're the United States of America, not the divided States of America. Right. And, and getting to that will be a huge challenge that we all have to share in solving. And I think one of the platforms, one of the means by which American leadership will be most on display in the 21st century will be a return to multilateralism. Yes. And you talked about it a little earlier. Let me get your, your thoughts on this. Uh, what does U.S. partnership really mean in the 21st century? In the 20th century, sometimes it looked hegemonic. And sometimes finding the, the, the clear partnership and the balance and the equilibrium was, was difficult. But in the 21st century, where there are peer competitors and enormous economic yep. pressures underway, climate, demographic uh, instability, et cetera, uh, it really demands American partnership in a multilateral way. What does that mean to you? And what should our allies be thinking about in terms of a reliable American partnership? Uh, uh, yeah. Um, so I can think of a few words that are not flattering about how we have led. Right. One is hubris. Yes. One is lack of humility, uh, and 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 probably a third is this notion of American exceptionalism, which is true sometimes, but not true all the time. Right. Uh, if we could just get over ourselves and realize that we have a lot to make up, a lot of people to learn from, and that as the indispensable partner, we're going to pay our dues and be part of the organizations we're already in, modernize those organizations. Uh, who, who doesn't think the UN, NATO, pick a, a few others, need modernizing? The WHO, they all do. But with our help, uh, they could be modernized in a way that wouldn't just help us, but with it would, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats, to quote John F. Kennedy, who was the inspiration for my getting into politics. It does. We can do all of those things. Uh, and it seems to me starting there uh, with one more thing uh, would be a good way to go. Biden has an excellent team. What could that team do beyond all this? Process, restore mm. process. Mm. It's the world's most boring word, but you would know that the late General Brent Scowcroft probably gets the gold star for the best national security advisor in the history of the world. He was a wonderful, humble man, yeah. Uh, who understood that the, the building blocks of process makes make for the best decisions. And if this foreign policy team uh, can rebuild process, which is in tatters, uh, and that process can be shared with our partners in these various international organizations, wow. Uh, and I'll, I'll make one last comment, you know, Woodrow Wilson, who had many flaws, especially in the area of racial justice, uh, was the guy who imagined um, the League of Nations, which became the, the UN, uh, which became one among many international organizations. He knew that that was the building block for peace. It's still the building block for peace. That's right. Well, you've mentioned many names this morning, uh, individuals you've pointed to as being exemplars of leadership. We asked you to join us for this conference because you, in fact, are an exemplar of leadership. You've certainly yes. been one for me. And could you give us some of your thoughts, your personal philosophy is what is at the heart of the leadership that Jane Harmon has displayed for all of us for so many years, uh, which has made our country truly a better country? What is your leadership philosophy, Jane? Well, after I stop crying, um, let me... <gasps> pull myself together and try to answer that. Uh, I was a kid growing up in Los Angeles, public school education until college. And I went to the Democratic Convention in Los Angeles in 1960, before most people's great grandparents were born. And I saw the nomination of John F. Kennedy for president. Mm. And I was an usher at his acceptance speech. And this whole idea 
of ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country has motivated me forever, you know, for 150 years, uh, including my long service in Congress. And uh, country first, party second. Mm. That's a huge part of what I have always thought was the right thing to do. Secondly, you know, I haven't missed the movie that I, I, I am female. Uh, when I went to Harvard Law School, there were very few women in the class. I have sure. hysterically funny stories to tell, even as an entering member of Congress. And I am the first woman to lead the Wilson Center. And mm. my, my, my comment about leadership by women is, first of all, it's very good. You know, we lead in, in many ways in our families. Uh, it's not something we have to learn later. Uh, women manage households, women manage children, women manage aging parents and, and et cetera, et cetera. Women manage difficult husbands sometimes, but uh, not all the time, but that's kind of the idea. So we, we come with leadership skills and we know how to compromise, which is now a dirty word, compromise to get results. So we bring good skills. As a woman leader, I have learned a couple of things. One, be confident. You have to be confident uh, that you are bringing skills to what you do. Number two, be prepared. Uh, don't whine and cry. Just be the best qualified person in the room. And three, finally, uh, set an example for those who are coming after you. Uh, it's a dirty little secret that some women don't help other women. Uh, that's not cool. And help other women and try to be a role model. I had many role models who happened to be women, one of whom was Geraldine Ferraro, the late mm. Geraldine Ferraro, who was the first woman nominated to a national party ticket. And when I spoke at her funeral, along with both Clintons, Madeleine Albright uh, and Fritz Mondale, who had the courage to nominate her as his vice president, or, uh, I, I just said, oh my God, I mean, this woman was amazing and she helped shape my life. So uh, now I'm gonna cry again, so I better stop. Well, she was magnificent, as have been so many of the names you've you've mentioned, Jane. Um, so as as people will watch this uh, conference and they will listen to the words we've spoken, one of the things that we would want to have is that people will have a commitment to learning as a result of what they've heard. So let me just ask a, a couple of thoughts, role models for you, those who have had well-documented lives of success and leadership. Can you suggest some of those names for our audience to then pursue the study of their lives as role models? Now, you know, the story of Jane Harmon is yet to be completed, uh, but there are many lives out there that have been well-documented. Are there role models that people can be studying where they'll learn the lessons that you've just spoken about and the lessons that will carry American leadership deep into the 21st century as a constructive, and as you said, an indispensable influence on the world stage. Well, uh, I started with two. I, I know you won't let me talk about you, so I'm not going to talk about you. But I'll talk about George, who uh, was a Thank great you. leader, military yes. leader, and yes. our first president, and who walked away from the job and said, it's just as important what happens uh, uh, when I leave as it what happened when I came. He knew how to leave. Uh, and else, another leader who knew how to leave was Nelson Mandela. Mm. And having recently, before the pandemic, been in South Africa with my some of my grandchildren, um, it, he was he leaves an astounding legacy there. Sadly, the com the country is not, in my view, in as good shape as when he left it. But he understood things. He understood how to forgive, and he certainly understood uh, how to wield power in an inclusive way. So I give him enormous credit for that. Uh, I mentioned. Uh, my friend Geraldine Ferraro, who was well-prepared, humorous, and gutsy, and I loved it. I just loved it, and uh, I knew her well. And, you know, there's some more examples in the Congress now. I'll mention my closest friend in Congress, Susan Collins, mm -hmm. who just survived, you know, the existential experience from hell in a very hard election. She's not in my party. Uh, she was outspent four to one. Uh, no one thought she'd make it but she held on and she exhibited grace and grit. And she's now in a, in a position in the United States Senate as, as a majority maker uh, for, for either side. And, uh, you know, I salute her, hard work, humility, bipartisanship. So, I, I mean, I could go on, but I'm, I'm saying that what I'd love to see is young women 
of course I would, uh, develop all those traits. And I will do my best. I try at the Wilson Center, which I'm leaving, by the way, in a couple months. Who knows what's next? But I will try, and I have tried for a decade uh, to help younger women succeed there. And we have a majority female workforce. Oh, by the way, I call that a good Well, story. I think we know what's next. <laughs> Well, it's it's a uh, I, I think the 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 women who've been appointed uh, to the next administration, uh, it is an exceptional uh, yeah. group of, of young leaders, mm -hmm. uh, and I hope people will be taking pages from their books, their leadership books, and as you say, you you're leading the Wilson leaving the Wilson Center, you're leading it and will be leaving it. But what I do know is that you'll continue to be that leadership exemplar for all of us as you go forward. And we're going to need that. We really are going to need that. So, Jane, thank you for joining us today. You know, Brookings and George Washington's Mount Vernon wanted to come together to bring real leadership uh, to this forum uh, to help us all to understand in the difficult era of the 21st century moving forward, what will American leadership really look like? But more importantly, what will it require? And what you have done today is to show us that it requires character and strength and assertiveness and intellect, not because you spoke about them, but because you live them. And I want to thank you for joining us today. It's been a wonderful opportunity to see you again. I look forward to seeing you actually at Mount Vernon as soon as we can do that. And uh, that can't come soon enough. Please stay well, stay healthy, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, John. And thank you for continuing leadership at Brookings and everywhere you go. Thank you very much.